grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As an Army chaplain, my role was an advisor to the commanding officer. I was asked to provide insight into the unit's morale to be a source of ethical and spiritual guidance. I may have saluted the other officers that were my superiors, but I only reported to the CO. Now, my first battalion commander was probably one of the commanders who most used me. And he had a particular way of calling me to come to him. Chaplain, he'd say, walk with me. And we would walk away from everyone, talk through his concerns and questions. I noticed that he did the same with others. Walk with me was his indication he had something to say to you. Well, in today's gospel reading, Jesus decides to take a walk with a couple of his followers who are heading toward Emmaus, a Roman garrison town about seven miles away from Jerusalem. While there was a Roman fortress in Jerusalem, it was only for the high festivals or special events when the Roman governor was in town. Most of the time, the governor, such as Pilate, lived closer to the coast. Caesarea Philippi was a favorite spot. The Romans did keep a minimal presence in Jerusalem, primarily as a warning to try to keep down the potential for political turmoil. But the Romans kept troops close to the city in case of unrest, and Emmaus was one place where they get located one of their garrisons. So because of the heavy Roman presence, Emmaus was more of a secular town than a Jewish community, a place where Jews and Gentiles coexisted, and we'll revisit this in a bit. It was later in the day of his resurrection, after the angels had appeared to a group of women who had come to the tomb with spices to anoint his body. They told the disbelieving disciples about their encounter with the angel. We're told that Peter checked out the tomb, but they could only marvel at the fact that it was empty. What happens next is Luke's record of Jesus' first physical appearance as the resurrected one, much earlier than his evening appearance to the eleven in the upper room. While the women rush off to tell the disciples what had happened to them, Jesus joins Cleopas and an unnamed disciple on the road. And for whatever reason, they do not recognize him as he strikes up a conversation. Hey guys, what's going on? What y'all talking about? Neither one of them readily speaks up. They're still trying to get their heads wrapped around everything that had taken place during this week. Finally, it's Cleopas who asks, are you the only ta guy in town that doesn't know what's taken place in Jerusalem this week? What are you talking about? And that's when they both speak up. Well, there's this man from Nazareth called Jesus. He was definitely a good man who taught with authority, who did all kinds of miraculous stuff for the past couple of years. Everybody seemed to like him, well, except maybe the religious types, but then again, they don't like anyone who isn't one of them. And so they managed to arrest him on some bogus charges, convince the Romans to crucify him. Now, we had thought he was the real deal, the Christ that God had promised to send. But here it is, three days later after he died. Some woman, women caused a commotion, claiming they had gone to the tomb but failed to see his, find his body, telling us that angels had announced he was alive. And a couple of our friends went out to check it. The tomb was empty. There was no sign of Jesus, just the barrel claws lying about. To which Jesus brusquely responds, O oh, foolish ones! and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And then Jesus begins to go through the testimony of the scriptures, Pentateuch, Pentateuch Psalms, Proverbs, prophets, pointing out to them all the places that spoke of the Christ and the promises of God. And as they approached Emmaus, 
Cleopas and the other guy ask him to stay with them. Hey, it's getting dark. Day's about done. And Jesus does. He went into the house with them. He sat down at table with them. He took up the bread that had been served, spoke a prayer of thanks over it, broke the loaf, began handing out its pieces. And that's when the two of them recognized who he was, just before he suddenly disappears. Didn't we feel on fire as he conversed with us on the road, as he opened up the scriptures to us? And we see them get up and scramble back to Jerusalem, back to that upper room, back to their fellow believers. The Lord has risen indeed. Now when you look at Luke chapter 24, there's three parts to it. Each part highlights the unbelief of everyone who knew Jesus, who had been with him during his ministry, the women at the tomb, the disciples on the road, the rest of the disciples in the upper room. Everyone seems to have this hard time grasping on what was going on. It wasn't that they refused to believe as much as they simply couldn't. It was simply incredible to them. The angels had to remind the women at the tomb what Jesus had said. Here on the road to Emmaus, Jesus had to do the same thing with Cleopas and the other guy. And even when he appears to them in the upper room, what do we hear Jesus say? Thus, it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Ah, but did you catch it? It was subtle. You may have missed it. That repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You see, if you and I had made that statement, most likely we would have said something more like beginning at Jerusalem. Because that's where they were. Jesus goes on to tell them to stay in the city till you're clothed with power from on high. They're in Jerusalem. And they were told to stay in Jerusalem. So it would make sense that they should have been told to be witnesses beginning at Jerusalem. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus says beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus goes from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now at first glance, that's not very impressive. Until you think about it. You see, Jerusalem and the temple were the center of the Jewish nation and its faith. Jerusalem represents the spiritual center of Judaism. The early church initially gathers in Jerusalem, but they will be instructed, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Notice the progression that Jesus pictures for his church from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Things may start in Jerusalem. The church certainly initially gathers at Jerusalem, but Jesus is speaking in terms of movement from Jerusalem. Jesus himself moves from Jerusalem to Emmaus. The journey of the gospel begins with a walk with Cleopas and the other guy. The first thing Luke records of the resurrected Jesus is his walking with two confused disciples lost in their thoughts from the spiritual center of their faith to a secular Roman garrison town before he appears to the eleven behind locked doors, before he breathes on them or gives them their commission or their marching orders. Before Jesus does any of the things that we will readily recall happening on that very first Easter, Jesus walks from the spiritual center of Jerusalem where the faith was forming to a secular Roman garrison town where the presence of the Lord is revealed in the breaking of bread. And in watching Jesus walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus, we're given an impression that the church was always meant to be a movement of the gospel. 
And this is where we often get things turned around in our minds. You see, when we say church, we mentally picture what? A structure with stained glass windows and altars and candles and pews in it. And we say things like, well, I'm going to church. Or church starts at 10.30 a.m. Or even, let's get our church on. Do you see the problem here? You see, when we think and speak of the church like this, we relegate it to a place. And then we settle into our place and we find our spaces that we occupy and ask visitors to get out of. The church, however, was never meant to be a place to settle or occupy. The church is a calling from God to his people. Walk with me. The word church in the Greek is ekklesia, which when properly translates means to be called out. The word as it's found in extra-biblical Greek texts and histories references the meetings of the Greek and Macedonian city-states. Think of the movie 300, where the Spartan king is confronted with Persian emissaries demanding Spartan capitulation. And although it's dramatically altered in the movie, Gathering the people in the city center for decision-making took place, and these were referred to as ecclesia. And so when God refers to his people as the church, he's not talking about where they gather, but what they do as a called-out gathering of folks. You are my witnesses, he tells us. We are God's people, and we're given a purpose by God's grace. Walk with me. Jesus' last recorded journey in Luke's gospel is leaving Jerusalem for Emmaus, leaving a Jewish city for a Gentile town, going from a spiritual center to a secular place. Between his resurrection and his appearance to the eleven, Jesus takes a trip, signaling the journey he intends for his people to take from their Jerusalem to the world. If you will, Jesus has left the building. And so should we. Now you and I have been privileged to hear and to read God's word. Brought to faith by the Spirit's indwelling presence and working. Because someone at some point brought us to Jesus through a faith conversation. It may have been our parents. It may have been grandparents or another family member. It may have been the result of marrying into the faith. Or a friend bringing us to Christ through their personal faith sharing. No matter how God connected us to himself in Christ Jesus, we are now the church God called and brought into existence. We're not a place, but a movement, which all begins with his gracious invitation, walk with me. While we gather in a church building to hear God's word, to receive his presence in the sacraments, we don't stay here. We're going to get up and we're going to go home. We're going to go back home to our neighborhoods. We're going to go back into our communities and we're going to be carrying Jesus with us in our words and with our deeds. That's how the church of God was built back then. This is how we continue to build Christ's church today as we walk with him by faith. Jesus left Jerusalem to go to Emmaus. And that sets the tone for his church. Going to people, bringing with us the gospel and the faith and the hope that it has to offer to all men. That's our mission. Disciples going and proclaiming the love of God in Jesus Christ. So may the Spirit lead us to accept our Lord's invitation to walk with me. And let us walk with Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in faith unto life everlasting. Amen. We rise.